Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. We are opening the doors wider for the next year of podcasts and taking a look at futures in music, both the systems that are changing or need to change, but also how this stuff is impacting live performance and community locally and globally. Please join us by subscribing on your favorite podcasting service and sharing this with your friends and colleagues. So let's get to the next podcast topic. At Music Biz in May of 2018, we had a wonderful time talking with Robert Singerman, who is VP International Publishing at Lyric Find. We had a wonderful time talking about Robert's 14-year quest to translate music legally between languages and cultures around the world. Robert shares the story of Lyric Find's path to a legal marketplace in the U.S. and then talks about the challenges now of trying to translate 50,000 songs in the top 15 languages. He sees this as a mission, a quest, with far-reaching social implications, and we enjoy talking with him on this podcast. My main mission for the last 14 years, actually, which is now uh, one of the Lyric Find missions, is to give music subtitles, so legal lyric translations. And all my travels and the different things that I do really support that mission. And Lyric Find is actually now in the business to give music subtitles. And so the business in many ways has really blossomed as both international and streaming have kind of simultaneously been growing at dramatic levels? Yes. Well, it's a digital business. So actually, when Lyric Find started in about 2004, uh, that's exactly the same time where I had this you know, idea. And I'll tell you the reason why I had this idea. I was representing the French Music Export Office in North America and the European Music Office, which was a European Commission of the European Union funded operation to really increase the sale and the media awareness of European music in the U.S. and French music in North America. There were slightly different territories, but Mm -hmm. these were simultaneous roles that I was offered in early 2004. And at the time, I said, well, you know, it's not a problem to increase the media awareness and the sales of European music and French music. However, we have a little problem. In the U.S., there's not that many people who speak French. Mm -hmm. So therefore... We ought to be able to uh, give music subtitles. And of course have we should. That sounds so logical, right? Understand the songs, yeah, because most of, I mean, unless it's an instrumental song, somebody wrote the lyrics for a purpose, music is about communication. We all know the history from the drums to the troubadours to, uh, you know, modern rock and roll and hip-hop and everything else. Um, it's about communication, the communication between the artist through the song to the as Bruce Springsteen says, to the person in the last row and the people who don't even get into the concert. But some of it's really culturally embedded as well. So the language is also somewhat of a cultural story. Absolutely. The songs, you know, express our culture, whether it's, you know, in Nashville or in New York or in, you know, New Orleans or, you know, anywhere around the world. Uh, And our cultures are all somewhat different and somewhat, we have some similarities also. So for me, The reason I love music and the reason I'm in this business is mainly because of what it means and what it means to people around the world. And uh, I want to support that. And I couldn't think of a bigger or stronger way to support it than to have a system where everybody could really understand everybody's songs. Now, you Uh, said 2004, right? Was that when you were saying? And so that was when we had YouTube starting up and... I think it was actually a little before YouTube, but I'm, I'm not really sure actually. But it was when I mean Wikipedia was already had already started, so there was crowd sourced information that was mm-hmm. actually bigger than the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think at the time, uh, lyrics online were all actually at that point unauthorized and crowdsourced in a very kind of uh, illegal way. It was yeah, it was peer to peer information trading. However, it was still valuable for the publishers and the songwriters at that time because the fans could learn the music. And heavily searched as well. 
heavily searched lyrics are the number one search term on the internet you know more than some other things that we might think are more well searched but um yeah and and it's been like that traditionally at least in the top 10 of every language and every country in the world for since search was counted um so actually lyric find started as uh as a lyric site and they realized how difficult it was to actually get licenses uh, from the music publishers, and they didn't really want to, you know, face copyright infringement uh, penalties and things. They were in college, and they thought, you know, this something should happen with this. Uh, but they didn't have the connections uh, to actually start the process until a little bit later. Um, the kind of funny story, which I think Daryl will be okay with me telling, is that um, he was at a conference, Canadian Music Week, which I just came from uh, last week, uh, and he met Ted Cohen, who was the head of digital at EMI. He's, he's an advisor to you guys? Uh, yeah, he's on our board. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they had an argument about, you know, free and piracy and, you know, uh, copyright protections and things like that. You know, Daryl was young and in college, and, and after the argument, they sat down and met, and then Daryl ended up uh, interning for Ted for... I think six months uh, as part of his college education. So they kind of shut the illegal lyric site down. And however, it was his Daryl's phone number, cell phone number was still on the website. Uh, and the funny story, which is the true story, is they were at an amusement park. He and one of the other co-founders, who's now our chief technical officer, uh, Mohammed Mutadain, were at an amusement park literally just about to get on a roller coaster ride, uh, a big one, and uh, they got a phone call from Microsoft who uh, wanted to see if it would be possible to license lyrics because Microsoft wasn't going to do anything that was... Well, that was in the Zune era, wasn't it? 2004 might be around then, yeah, and um, might have been one of my friends who called them or something, I don't <laughs> know, John Kurtz or something, I'm not really sure, you know... They were like, well, let's uh, do a little research. So they called Ted up, actually, and said, Ted, what do you think? You know, should we actually give this a go or not? Uh, you think we can actually license it? And Ted said, well, I can help you with EMI and, you know, make some introductions to the other companies. And that started the process, and I believe that was in 2004. That was, uh, and at the same time, when I had my, you know, grand idea of making music accessible to everybody, making lyrics understandable around the world, I was at Midem uh, in Cannes, which I'm going to in a couple of weeks, and ran into a friend of mine who I knew from Paris, I was living in Paris at the time, uh, who was working at Gracenote, and he told me what Gracenote does, because I hadn't really heard about it, frankly, before that. I was like, hmm, this sounds like the ideal partner as well for for lyrics uh, and giving music subtitles, and then he told me a secret that, at that point, it was a secret that Gracenote was starting to be in the lyric business. This was just after they kind of went into everybody's computers and figured out where all the illegal peer-to-peer things were. I think it was for Megadeths. Uh, uh, so anyway, so Grace Note at that point seemed to be a logical potential partner. And Grace Note was also very, the, the executives, the CEO and the CTO of Grace Note uh, were very excited about the opportunity, but it was way early. And, you know, I was naive and I thought, oh, you know, I could, could we get this done, but... So what were the blockades to it, other than the fact that... Licensing. Was it uh, just licensing, or the, the fact that... Well, there was no leg- legal lyrics online, yeah. so the licenses were only just starting, and Lyric Fine was starting about the same time as Grace Note was starting. Mm-hmm. The story I heard from Grace Note was Mr. Peer from Peer Music, who's one of the most eminent and respecta- respected people in the music industry, and in the publishing industry specifically, realized that you know lyrics online and tabs, guitar tabs online were an issue. So, uh, you know, he tasked somebody who worked with him at that point to find a solution and that person went to Grace Note and actually that person is now running the biggest legal tab market in the world, you know. And what Grace Note did and Lyric Find did was work on actually contacting all the illegal lyric sites around the world and starting to make them legal. Uh, because none of the sites, like Daryl's site, couldn't really do it themselves and would have to actually have a large amount of money to, to get the licenses cleared with all the major music publishers or at least the right connections. So most of the revenue models then were no money going out to anyone and ad money coming in for people who were searching the web coming in through Google or 
whatever search engine was happier than. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and then people that not necessarily going anywhere from there, that they then were off singing the song, playing the song, doing something with it without necessarily connecting the dots on everything. Right. And, you know, the lyric, the quality of the lyrics online at that time wasn't very high. Uh, and, you know, the information was gathered by people listening to songs and things. So, and there was no credits, no writer attributions, no publisher attributions. You know, there was, it was a uh, kind of the Wild West. And it was, you know, the beginning of the internet. So, um, we helped make it a legal market. And in the United States right now, almost everything is actually legal and licensed. So, we've had to, uh, work with the NMPA. When I say we, that was actually Lyric Fine and Grace Note, who worked with the NMPA to the National Music Publishers Association, to find and threaten and sue and cajole and say, isn't it a better idea to really pay for music? Uh, and then you can increase your ad rates and things like that. All the different um, uh, companies that were doing illegal sites or the sites would have to be closed down. Uh, and that's what happened. And most everybody who had a site that was of note and had some traffic would prefer to legalize it and, uh, you know, pay the share to the publishers, uh, which is a very difficult process also. So the difference between Grace Note and us was because Grace Note came out of CDDB, you know, kind of... Which so for those who don't know what CDDB is... It's the um, tracking system that allowed people to actually find music and send music to their friends and was really the kind of beginning of piracy in essence on the web. It was a very useful service at the time for the people that were online. There was nothing that was legal. There, nothing existed that was legal. So it was just a way for people to listen to music and trade music and send music you know, across other areas and uh, my understanding is that it was created that you know they actually did it through the duration of the songs and people were were listening to music online and sending music online uh, through that process but because of that and because I believe at the time Sony owned Grace Note um, Grace, Grace Note's I think switched hands a few times in the meantime. It's owned by Nielsen now yeah. Mm -hmm. We're now facing an era now that you've got everything least U.S. legal, that we are now having so much music that is being listened to globally. How does all this work and what is now your big challenge of the, the translation side of this interesting side of the business? Okay, well, um, to catch up 14 years quickly, <laughs> eventually what happened and what has actually changed things in the music business and in, for fans as well is that YouTube is now doing uh, closed captioning, which is lyric translation, and Elizabeth Moody, who's now the head of Pandora, but at that time was the head of YouTube, said it was basic, basically because of my work, because I was going around the world talking about it, and you know, especially the people in Asia and other major countries thought it was a great idea, and, and they had a lot of experience uh, in different countries with using lyric translations for the MTV-like television video clip shows, which would then subtitle the video clips in the local language and every time any TV station did that usually the the number I always heard anecdotally was 400 percent rise in, in viewership and it would kind of clean up in the market and it would be the, the number one um, provider because everybody wants to understand the songs of mm -hmm. at that point it was mostly anglophone music that was being kind of marketed and anglophone promoted being English language yeah uh, music that was being marketed and promoted so anytime they did the translations and it was also other other languages within their uh, region as well, within their country, that, that if they translated into the other languages, like in Malaysia, it's Chinese and Malay, and uh, if they translated it, it would really make a huge difference. So everybody outside of the music industry <laughs> understands the value of localization. The music industry never really did, because to translate a song, you would have to negotiate song by song for the rights to translate, and how much of your baby... And it's a physical baby, process, isn't it, too? How much then? of your baby do... I want for the right to translate your song and you know is it the same song or is it you know the adaptation versus translation and there's choice in the translation well we're translating from meaning we're okay. not translating 
like my way to write a new song uh, or to make sure that it's still rhyming or yeah, looking exactly, at the, yeah, exactly the it patterning will, yeah, yeah it will generate significant amount of cover tunes in different languages uh, where people will do that and then they'll have to go to the publisher to get the rights for adaptation if if they want to actually do it but this is just a means to understand all the lyrics to understand you know the songs uh, so who does the translation then okay so it's not happening yet, except for through Google Translate on YouTube, and oh. they have some crowd, some crowd participation in that. Really, it's, it's generated, for example, in the Latin market, a 44% rise in Latin music oh, in the cool. U.S. sales this year. I think a lot of it's attributed to the simultaneous showing of the Spanish songs, Spanish and and Portuguese songs in English with with the closed captioning, and. People at the major labels have agreed with me on that at different panels around the, on the, around the world. And yeah, it's, it's a major difference for people who don't speak Spanish to be able to start to understand reggaeton and all the other music. And also the artists, you know, Justin Bieber and uh, Beyonce and the people who are collaborating with some of the Spanish writers, they can actually understand the, the Spanish writers' lyrics uh, pretty much for the first time ever as well through, through the closed captioning. So in terms of the translation process that we're going to employ, because it would cost a, a, a very significant amount of money to, to have professional yeah. translators do this. So it's going to be done by crowdsourced translators. We're plugging into the to major communities of translators around the world. There's like a, literally a language learning um, company in Italy that has literally, sorry, in India that has 100 million language learners. Uh, and some of those professors uh, will be will be doing some of the translations, could like Bollywood. Could it be Bollywood. tapped into Duolingo? Uh, it could be tapped into probably anything. Yeah, Duolingo actually. I know Duolingo has a very good um, uh, system for translation. In yeah. fact, there's a woman who works for us at Lyric Find, uh, who's a PhD in you know translations, and sh she thinks Duolingo is the best of of those. So uh, Duolingo companies. is actually created by a Carnegie Mellon doctoral graduate mm -hmm. um, who, yeah, th I, mean, I love this, it's like his third company that he created right. that was all about crowdsourcing by gameplay. Right, uh, right. So it's an interesting yeah, we're, tool. You know, we're we're going to have gamification as well. We're working with the company that's the largest and I, th I think most successful video captioning company, so translations, that their real mission is to translate everything that there's visual accompaniment with. Uh, it's called .sub.com. And as soon as I explained my mission to the owner of that company, he was like, you know, we're brothers, basically, and that's his mission. Brothers and from another yeah, right, digital whatever. mother, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I'm making this all um, happen. So, so Dot Sub is, is currently working with us to create the best and quickest also, because we want to actually get this rolling soon, platform that has elements of gamification. It's a crowdsourced, but they also have major numbers of translators in their different... They did the TED Talks for the first four years. They did the platform for the TED Talks for oh, the first four okay. years. And they, they have major clients who are some of our clients also. In so anyway, um, we're creating the in, an, an engaging um, platform for people. There are other lyric translation sites out there right now, but none of them are really um, business to business. They're business to consumer. Our whole motto is... You're the intel inside of the translation side. Yeah, we're the business to business leader by far. Uh, and uh, there's really nobody else that's... I mean, there are competitors, but they're more business to consumer. Uh, so we have the sub-licensing rights to the lyrics and to the lyric translations because uh, that's what took us 14 years really is, I mean, it took Lyric Fine three or four years just to get the major publishers on board for just lyrics. Um, but because all the major publishers are trusted partners and clients for many years, enjoy working with Lyric Fine, and there's a good relationship, we've been able to also add the lyric translation part of it, monetizing lyric translation. Because my research on the number of cross-lingual searches versus within the same language group, it's very significant. I mean, I think conceivably, I, I think we could uh, do very well, and I think it's actually, again, mostly it's a really, uh, it's a major boon to the human population to be able to understand songs from different language cultures. But also will greatly increase search, too, right? To be able to search for it, well, we are search for lyrics. Our and clients, Microsoft it. Bing was a client for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Google is a recent client, Google Search, which is great. So we're exhibiting billions of lyrics a year now. 
probably getting close to a billion a month uh, wow. monetized and, and legal. Um, and you're saying that it's been a great double, uh, hefty double digit lift where it's happened already. It certainly is with the YouTube closed captioning. I mean, if you can look at the trends on YouTube, mm -hmm. there's lots and lots of people searching the lyrics in their language, and a lot of lyric translations are actually pretty mediocre on certain language pairs. English to Spanish is pretty easy because there's a lot of history, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of phrases that have been translated, but if you go to less popular languages, English and Spanish are the number two and three languages, respectfully, respectively, to... Um, you know, Mandarin uh, in the world with about a half a billion speakers each, native speakers. Of course, English has many more non-native speakers than Spanish, but that still means that there's uh, 14 times the amount of people, 7 billion plus people in the world who are not native English speakers. And lyrics aren't the easiest uh, thing to understand anyway, and that's why there's a lot of, you know, search for English artists. When you hear something, it's fast, or the mix is different, or the accent is different. It's hard for me to understand Eminem, but when I saw him for the first time, when I saw his songs in the written form, actually on the movie Eight Mile, where they did subtitle his songs, I was like, wow, this guy's a phenomenal writer. You know, yeah. I knew he was a great writer, but I didn't really, you know, I, I was never, a f my son is a big fan, but, you know, I was never, you know, a, a, a huge hip-hop fan myself, although I'd worked with some hip-hop. The ability to understand songs across languages will, you know, in many, many instances, I think will change a lot in the world. It'll help increase tourism. It'll give people the ability to understand their neighbors. Or they it could even create new genres. I mean, there's lots of, of sort of hybrid genres that are now coming right. as music continues to be mobile across borders and now cross languages. Right. Could inspire sure. to finally figure out, um, maybe <laughs> in my case, what the heck the, the Mandarin hip hop folks are actually singing. I'm right. very confused most of the time on that. We've been talking a lot here today, I've been listening a lot here at Music Biz in Nashville about the impact of voice and mm -hmm. voice search. Mm -hmm. How will that intertwine, or do you anticipate that this is yet another piece of information that is going to be in that perpetually hungry maw of looking for how people actually ask for music? Yes, I mean, I went to a couple of the voice um, panels myself. I saw the Amazon panel, and Amazon's a client of ours, a very big client of ours. We power the Amazon search. Uh, they were talking about, you know, play me the song that goes whatever, and you have a few words, and that comes up because it's in our database, and we have the search, and then it's played on whatever service there is uh, that you have, actually, through Amazon or uh, the other ones. That will be increased, I believe, by people speaking to uh, Alexa in Spanish or in Portuguese, and you know they can say things like, "Play me the uh, the uh, uh, well, play me the the song that goes like this." Yeah, which also really increases the opportunities for music to be synchronized. What we say in our deck, which I believe is 100% true, is that really a fan knowing a song increases the value of the song, the revenue of the song, and the revenue of the song through all the different music revenue sources. Because when you know the words to a song, you're more likely to uh, want to go to a concert, you're more likely to want to sing karaoke, you're more likely to, there's more sync placements as people can search for horses in Japanese or in Chinese or whatever, a song about horses that's kind of a hip-hop no song. There's no longer any bar bets because you don't you know immediately what the answer to what is that song lyric or what's the correct song lyric. Or, um, well, you can find the answer quicker than you used to be able to. You can find the answer quicker. Uh, so right. where might this go? I mean, you're, you're, you're catching fire on a concept to make a pretty big change on one of the major data elements of songs. When you're talking about translating a song, you're taking a single song and turning it into how many different translated so languages? So our plan at this point, it's a plan, uh, is, to, is to translate the top 50,000 songs by demand that are in our database uh, that also are synced to audio because with the services like Deezer, uh, for example, when you're listening to the song, you also, the lyrics are scrolling in time. So you see the words and hear the music at the same time and then it can be sing-along or whatever as well. So what we're doing is the top 50,000 by demand, which will probably be at least 90% of the demand, unfortunately. But at the same time, we're allowing people to add their own songs, you know, fan favorites in 
many different languages because we're doing the top 15 languages. Uh, uh, that's the plan to translate into 15 languages. So that's 750,000, you know, lyric translations. Um, by the time we actually launch it on our B2B client services, uh, we'll have many more than 50,000 and we'll have a bunch of great songs from around the world and maybe even disappearing languages or disappeared languages or barely still here languages, which I think is also really important because, uh, you know, we want this also to um, increase the ability for young people who are maybe uh, diaspora of a different country to actually start to learn their own songs uh, and be able to understand them in you know the language where they've moved to and vice versa so you know I think it does have a, a real impact on people when you can understand the culture uh, around you and understand your the culture of your heritage as well um, well so many artists are I mean the touring business internationally is growing tremendously right now so could artists also play into this themselves and provide translations absolutely, absolutely. I mean Pete Seeger did that with the Mexican groups that he used to tour, a Mexican group, and U2 does that in certain language markets where they'll translate the songs. And I've seen a lot of people use very creative ways of, of translation. And um, there's a fantastic artist and uh, writer in uh, Brazil named Emacida who, when I met him, you know, he decided, okay, this sounds good, and he decided to actually translate all his Portuguese lyrics. And I had to... I couldn't stop watching the video. He did the whole album, and he's such a great writer, you know, and lis reading reading his songs when I first heard it because they were just so engaging as a writer and as an activist and a, with a social message as well. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that people are going to really... Um, so you mentioned touring. So, uh, I mean, and you mentioned the impact. I mean, imagine movies without subtitles or television without dubbing or opera without surtitles. There wouldn't be much international business, uh, you know, or cross-lingual business uh, I without those uh, aspects. And that's what music's been like. And traditionally, people just stole songs from different cultures because they couldn't get the rights. And uh, they or have they a whole... No one would necessarily notice. There's a whole history of that. Yeah, France, it's called Yeah Yeah Music, you know, which is basically rock and roll, American rock and roll. And some of the stuff was almost the same but you know they just couldn't get the rights and do it and you know they so they so they did it themselves and music does cross culture and now it'll cross culture and be understandable so that cultures can cross boundaries and I don't think he was pulling my leg at all really but you know when when I was talking about it the first time with the then CEO of Grace Note who's now a very powerful um, executive running another major company that does a lot of crowdsourced information. Anyway, he said, oh, that's Nobel Peace Prize. He said, you know, because we're talking about Palestine and Israel and things like that, you know. I was like, well, let's just get it done and, you know, <laughs> see what happens. But, I mean, I, I do really think it's important and I think that, I think it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited that after uh, 14 years of working on this, it's finally uh, starting to come to pass. And like I said, YouTube has paved the way, so more power to them. Uh, and I think it's great that they've done that. I mean, it's a, it's a huge investment for them probably to change the infrastructure and the you know, user interface and all that. Uh, and Google is actually very, very concerned and working very hard now to protect copyrights. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of lawsuits lately, not with Google, you know, with other major services. Uh, and, you know, they've employed a great team at Google who have worked very hard in the publishing industry before. And, you know, so we see that everything is moving in the right direction. Uh, uh, that's my belief anyway, and I'm not, I mean, it's just, it seems like even in countries like China, where copyright is a whole new concept, um, uh, Russia, Brazil, well, things... Well, Tencent in, in China, and we've had prior conversations actually on this podcast about you know, investing in actually having mobily robust, non-pirated content is really picking up pretty tremendously there. So that opens up new whole possibilities absolutely, with all this. Absolutely, and, and um, my thinking about it goes to some of the history of the music industry where Japan was always the number two market in the world for non-Japanese music. It was number one for Japanese music, but for anything else, Portuguese, English, French, German. Why? Because they actually translated not only the lyrics, but also the liner notes so that people can understand the context of the songs. And at that point, the Japanese 
to in the international to Japanese repertoire ratio was probably 60-40 international. Now it's like 85 domestic and 15 uh, local, and that's also with the files share. You know, files. You know, the the digital. You know, without credits, without information, mm -hmm. you know, you lose the context and you really lose the value of the song. So imagine if. Um, if the Chinese market, you know, 1.5 billion people becomes at least 30% international because people can finally understand the songs and they do translate, you know, uh, without, monetiz without uh, monetization and authorization now. So uh, eventually that's going to change the dynamics in China and India and countries. I mean, people think Indians speak English, but it's not really true. A lot of people in India do, but it's really only the college-educated people generally who speak uh, English fluently, uh, so there's still, you know, a couple of more than a couple of billion people uh, in China and India alone that don't speak English and, and don't are understand generating English and music. And so and part of it's coming the other direction as well. Uh, the other direction is, you know, what I'm probably personally more interested in. But you know, for Anglophone music, it also provides tremendous opportunities. Well, 14 years of time well spent and well, thank being, you very being much. right now at the edge of some really interesting things happening. So thank you very much for joining us. Any last comments as we, as, we, as we tune off? The other thing that's changed recently, as you know, I'm sure, and all everybody else knows, is the penetration worldwide of the mobile uh, phone as a music source, uh, you know, many places. As a life media source. As a life media source, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, banking and healthcare and everything else come over the phone. And that, and I've been to Africa recently in places where people don't have electricity, but they solar power their phones and they have phones and it's the center. So now music can, is really, can hit everybody without electricity, without s stereo systems, without computers, you know, with a, with a telephone, and, and that is a new source for, for music. And many people in the emerging market worldwide do not speak English as the de facto export music language, and they have their own history of phenomenal songs, uh, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that, that for me would be great for everybody else to be able to understand. So for exporting music from anywhere, uh, the mobile phone is, is obviously we have global services now. We're not sending plastic thousands of miles. It's, you know, it's digital information. Uh, and we have the ability to um, have people understand and monetize and legalize uh, and credit, you know, attributions for for artists from around the world, for writers from around the world. So it may not be the, the Nobel Peace Prize, but you are going to be bridging cultures and people who yeah. will now know more about each other's hearts and heads. Absolutely, and that's what that's what excites me, and you know, that's what I've always been doing, actually, in my career, too. So, And like I said, this came through the export office uh, kind of route. All so. comes full circle. Yep. Well, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank well, you. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again. <laughs>